I'd like to welcome you here in person, as well as those of us gathered online. If you are in the back in person looking for a seat, there's a bunch of seats to my right, a bunch of seats to my left. You are welcome down front. We don't care. Uh, it really is a privilege to gather with you. We come together, and if you're here and you are a follower of the way of Jesus, we, we call this day Good Friday. It, it's ironic in its language, Good Friday. It is a day of great tragedy, yet triumph. It is this blended feel in the tone of a day of a funeral and the loss of a loved one meets this glorious and mysterious declaration throughout all of eternity. It is well with my soul. We are going to spend our time together today working through two things. We, we are going to work through Isaiah chapter 53. It's 12 verses. We'll work through Isaiah chapter 53. But throughout it, we're going to stop at three separate times. We're going to stop and do our best with the text to overlay the last 24 hours of Christ's life or what led up to this day that we call Good Friday. Now, if you're familiar with Isaiah 53, then here's what you might know. It, it was a text written approximately 700 years before the day Jesus would die. It was written by a prophet by the name of Isaiah, and it is proclaiming this promised one, this Messiah, this king. But it won't be a king who comes with this strength, who comes demanding a crown, who rules with an iron scepter demanding bow. No, it will be a king who instead of taking, would give. This Messiah would be different. He would not be a Messiah who comes and demands you bow. But he would allow himself to be broken that you might actually find blessing. So it's with that I'd invite you. You're welcome to turn with me to Isaiah 53. You can follow along on the screen behind me. But before we do this, I, I want to have a moment of 10 seconds of reflection. Here, here's why gathering in a noon on Friday. Many of you are perhaps here on your lunch break. You've made plans. You've got to get back to the office. Many of you, you have kids beside you, kids in tow. Many of you online, you are stepping aside in the lunch break to gather and watch with us. But what can come with that is our hearts can have a tendency to still be moving fast. It's 12, 24. Approximately. 24 minutes ago, as Christ had already been on the cross for three hours, the sky went dark. He would hang there for another three, choosing between pain and breathing. We'll talk about what led to that moment. We'll talk about what followed that moment. But I just want to stop in 10 seconds of silence. Ask God to slow beating hearts, to be present. You're welcome to join me if you feel comfortable. Isaiah chapter 3, 53. Verses 1 through 3. Isaiah wrote, speaking of Christ, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him, speaking of Christ, like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. Man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. 
if you want to really break down the events of Good Friday or this, this mysterious combination of triumph meets tragedy, you really have to start the evening before. The evening before, Jesus would have gone to celebrate Passover. This famous Jewish celebration where he would have sat with friends and dined in a prepared meal and in it there would have been food and drink and wine and laughter as well as heartbreak. He would come. He would die as our Passover lamb. During this dinner, he would come and he would say, this is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. But there were some key events, some key people to where this was no ordinary dinner. All the disciples would be gathered. Jesus would come and he would use language. If one of you is going to betray me, they would all say, no, not me. It won't be me. And then he, in some secretive way, would connect with his disciple, Judas. And he would say to Judas, hey, Judas, go and do what you have come here to do. See, Judas had believed a lie of Satan, and he would have Jesus betrayed. Judas would get up from the table and leave. The discussion would continue. They would come and Jesus would say, the shepherd is going to be struck. And when the shepherd is struck, the sheep will scatter. The whole room, these men, these 11 remaining men would say, it won't be me. I would never reject you. I would never leave you. I would never abandon you. And then there is Peter. Peter's my favorite. He would say, they might leave you. Me, Jesus. I'm with you to the end. And he'll say to Peter, Peter, you will leave me. You will abandon me. Isaiah 53, verse 3, reminding you, he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and yet we esteemed him not. See, the, the cross shows this beautiful thing. Good Friday, it, it shows this. Despite our rejection of Jesus, the disciples, with all of their good intentions, yet lack of awareness, they have rejection for the king of kings. Rejection, and he is sitting at a table prophetically telling them, I'm going to be broken and I'm going to bleed. Why? So even in your rejection, you will always have an invitation home. You will leave me, but I come for you. Jumping back in Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 4, the prophet wrote, Surely he, speaking of Christ, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement, the punishing judgment, the chastisement that brought us Peace, shalom. With his wounds, we are healed. And we all, like sheep, have gone astray. And we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. From this moment of the upper room, Jesus will go and he will get away to a garden. It's a garden he was familiar with. It's the Garden of Gethsemane. And he would go to pray. He has all of his disciples where he would invite them. Pray with me. You don't know what awaits me, but it will be hard. Pray with me. He will even go and get away with a little bit of like an inner circle of disciples and say, pray with me. Pray with me. They would fall asleep as he would go and he would speak with his father about the suffering that was to come. He would describe this suffering like a cup, a chalice. This chalice held in it the chastisement of God. The wrath of God for the sins of humanity, the disciples' sins, your sins, my sins. And he would endure them all, feeling the insurmountable, overwhelming weight of what it would mean to be torn from the Father and forsaken. He will literally sweat blood from the duress. 
he'd eventually come back to his disciples somewhere between 9 p.m. to approximately 3 a.m. He'd wake them up and he'd say, hey, we got to get up. We got to go. Why? Why do we got to go? They're here. Jesus would walk to meet his betrayer. His betrayer, Judas, would show up with a mob. Judas would come and he would betray him with a kiss. There would be a moment of a little bit of a scuffle and Christ would bring peace to it. No one would take his life. He would lay it down. This had always been in the plan of Friday, the truth of Good Friday. His tragedy, our triumph. We look back and we think about this moment Christ there, the disciples abandoning him as he is arrested, and we are able to look back up and remember verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken. I won't follow you that far, God. Smitten by God and afflicted. Following the disciples' abandonment, Jesus would go with this mob willingly, he would go with this mob and he would endure three different Jewish religious trials. He would go before the former high priest Annas. He would go before the current high priest Caiaphas. And from that, he would go before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, the Jewish elite. And they would come and they would trump up false charges against him. They would absolutely and unjustly have a court They would speak lies over a man whose name is truth. They would say you offend God when he is God. Verse 5 from Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds, we are healed. You see, in this moment, what would Christ come to die for? Who would Christ come to die for? He's there. He's gathered. This is the religious elite. These are the good of the good, the moral of the moral. And Jesus is showing, I have come not just for the down and out, not just for the broken, the downtrodden, the forgotten, the abandoned, the overlooked, the neglected, the oppressed. He absolutely came for them, but he came for the moral elite. He came for those who on Good Friday would sit there and honestly think, I'm not that bad. See, the cross has this amazing declaration where it is showing there is a difference. There is an eternal difference between being religious and being righteous. Knowing about God and saying, that's my king. He would die for them all. From the moment of the religious trials, you see this glimpse into two tragic denials. The first being Peter. Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, the one who said, I'll never abandon you. Peter will go and betray Jesus before a small, young woman. Peter, with a sense of shame, will run. The other one to betray Jesus is Judas, the one who went and he took 30 pieces of silver and said, you give me this blood money and I will give you the so-called king. Judas would have a moment of remorse. He would come and he would take these 30 pieces of silver. He would walk back to the priests and he would throw the money into the temple. But Judas would never know repentance. You see, there's a fascinating thing. Both Peter denied him and Judas Denied him. But Peter believed there was a way home. Judas believed a lie that he was never welcome back. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. Peter went astray. Judas went astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. You would have left him. I would have left him. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He took the chastisement for Peter, 
for Judas, for you, for me. The cross is this anthem into eternity, that Jesus Christ did not come with this screaming sense of condemnation. How could you? How dare you? Who do you think you are? I am God. He came with an anthem of freedom. I know your sin. You think you know your sin? He knows your sin far better. I know your sin. I have not come to condemn you. I have come to make you whole. It's not a statement of condemnation. It is a call to freedom. Judas would die believing a lie. By the grace of God, Peter would live, allowing God to demonstrate him a truth. You are welcome here. Jumping back into our third theme of Isaiah 53, starting in verse 10. Verse 10 says this. Yet it was the will of God to crush him. It was God's will to crush him so he wouldn't have to crush you. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of Christ's soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors and makes intercessions for the transgressors. Following three religious trials in the betrayal of two disciples, one eventually coming home, the other dying in a lie, Jesus would go and he would appear before three Roman trials. See, Romans, they had the authority, the ability for capital punishment. They could kill him. His first appearance would come before Pilate. Pilate was the governor of Judea. The Jewish leadership brought with them statements against Jesus, indictments of he incites riots. He tells people not to pay their taxes, and he claims to be a king. Pilate would interrogate, he would interview, he would plead with Jesus, is this true? Tell me what is true. He would find no reason to kill this Galilean, this teacher, this rabbi, this healer, this so-called king. Pilate, not wanting to make a decision for passivity and cowardice and fear, he would send Jesus to Herod. Herod, too would find no guilt in this so-called son of man to be the son of God. Herod would turn him to Pilate. Pilate, not knowing what to do, would try to find another way out, where every year at the Passover festival, he, as a Roman leader, would give back to the Jewish people one criminal, one cruel criminal, and he would say, here's what you have, Jewish mob gathered outside his palace. You can have one criminal back, and he presented two. He gave an option. You can have Barabbas, or you can have this Jesus. Barabbas, this murdering, insurrectionist, evil, unrepentant man. Or you can have the so-called Messiah, the kind, compassionate teacher, never acting in violence, but giving dignity to the forgotten, you choose, crowd. Who do you want? Who do you want? And the crowd, with a growing anthem underneath the lies and the deception of the religious leadership, would come and they would chant and they would scream, Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Isaiah 53.10 to remind you. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. Do 
Jesus was going to die. We, like the crowd, would choose Barabbas. You see, the cross, it demonstrates this amazing thing, and even in the choice of Barabbas or Jesus, it says this, that you and me, in our default, in our spiritual brokenness, in condition apart from God, you and I, we do not want him. We don't want him. That's why many of us, even though we know Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells us, we go through life and we make decisions still not wanting him. The anthem of our flesh is I choose Barabbas. The anthem of Christ is I choose you. To say it differently or more emotionally, it would be this. God, I don't want you. But John, I want you. It is a good Friday. It's a day of tragedy and triumph because in it there is a real rejection of God and an invitation to you and me. From that moment of Pilate coming in this faux show of symbolism, he would wash his hands, he would pronounce Jesus guilty. From there he would be scourged, literally beaten, bloody. He would then be mocked by Roman soldiers before he was commanded to carry a cross, a cross weighing approximately 100 pounds. He'd have to carry this cross about a mile until he would come from outside the city gates, his body from being up all night, the beating he endured in the scourging and the mocking. He could no longer physically carry it, and a man named Simon would be forced to help him. He would get to the cross, Golgotha or Calvary, the place of the skull. The cross would be laid down. He would be commanded and required to lay on it. His feet would be pierced. His hands would be pierced. He would be lifted up. 9 a.m. Over those next three hours, he is mocked by the ones he came to save. The religious leaders, the Roman soldiers, the crowd, the thieves beside him. Verse 12 of Isaiah 53. Therefore, I will divide him with a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Hear this. He poured out his soul to death. Nobody took it. He gave it as a sacrificial offering to win back his bride, the church, you, me. He poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Their transgression became his transgression, yet he bore the sin of many. And he makes intercession for them. He would end that time where at noon, the sky would turn dark. For three hours, he would endure, not simply just the choice between breathing or pain, not simply the reality of the excruciating torture of the day's events, but what it meant to be torn from intimacy with who he is, the love of the Father, the character of the triune God, Father, Son and Spirit, their oneness ripped apart. He would cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is forsaken so that we might be forgiven. He would come towards about 3 p.m. He couldn't stay up there longer. He had done what he had come to do. He drank the cup. He endured the wrath. He had lived righteously the will of the Father. And he would bow his spirit, bow his head, and he would give up his spirit. He would have one line before his departure where he would say, It is finished. Isaiah 
chapter 53, verse 11, to remind you. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. You see, the cross, Good Friday, is this divine day of evil yet exultation. It's a day marked by deep tragedy and triumph. But here's what we must know. The cross demonstrates something. The cost of our redemption, the cost of being made right with God, put back together, healed and whole, not perfect until we see him face to face, but new, redeemed, clean, pure, Beloved brother or sister, son or daughter, the cost of that redemption was his crucifixion. There was no means absent of the Father's perfect will in his plan. Of having you having me, of an understanding of God where he is the most glorious, beautiful, kind, merciful, loving Father, where Christ is a big brother, and not just a big brother that tolerates you, but a big brother that calls you friend, even though that big brother knows all of your brokenness, your baggage, and your dysfunction, living in union with the Holy Spirit, God within you. A promised inheritance that you live in from the moment of faith until the day in eternity he grants it to you as you worship him. There is no means of that without him passing through the cross. So why do we call it Good Friday? Because we, we would have been like the disciples, the best of intentions, and then we abandon him. Why do we call it Good Friday? Because we, we would have been like the religious leaders, soaking in a sense of our self-righteousness in comparison to others, all the while seeing true righteousness before us and bringing shame to it when it should evoke glorious repentance. Why do we call it Good Friday? Because we, we would have been like the crowd. The offering, do you want this so-called king, this healer, this messiah, this teacher, this lover? Or do you want Barabbas? Give us Barabbas! And he would still come for us. He would still call his people by name throughout eternity and say, what must you do to know me? What must you do to call this day good? Behave, perform, fix yourself, clean it up. No. Believe I knew you at your worst, and I chose you at your worst. Believe I saw your sin, and yet I give you my righteousness. Believe that you don't deserve his love. But he so desperately wants you in his family. The tension of tragedy, the beauty of triumph. The cross was meant for terror, Christ made it triumph. The cross was meant for Satan's victory, but it was his ultimate defeat. The cross was meant for our punishment, yet it became our freedom. The cross was meant for death but by his grace became our hope. I'd love for you to join me in watching a, a poem. It's a video compiled, it's about four minutes long, describing the beauty of the cross and the reality of Good Friday. Following this poem, I'll come back up, we'll have a time of worship, and we'll close with an act of glorifying God through communion. But if you would join me in watching this poem, 
which was put together by our friends at Passion City Church. cross. It was meant to horrify the world. It was meant for humiliation. It was meant to last for days. It was meant for slow asphyxiation. It was meant to prolong torture. It was the Roman soldier's job. It was meant to be used by Caesar, but instead, it was used by God. It was meant to stop a movement, but instead, it became the way. It was meant to act on fear, but instead, it awakened faith. It was meant to be vicious and violent, but instead, it became our peace. It was meant to uproot hope, but instead, it became the seed. It was meant to punish captives, but instead, it unleashed freedom. It was meant to build up Rome, but instead, it built God's kingdom. It was meant to discourage rebels. It was meant to stop insurrection. It was meant to put down Jesus, but instead, it set up his resurrection. It was meant to jeer and mock him, but instead it was his glory. It was meant to erase a chapter, but instead it became the story. It was meant to hold up convicts, but instead it raised up a king. It was meant to shut our mouth, but instead it's why we sing. It was meant to be a judgment, but instead it became our mercy. It's why the song of heaven is the lamb. The lamb is worthy. It was meant to kill an enemy, crush dissenters and diversion, but instead it became the banner of God's love for every person. It was meant to be appalling, nailing hands and feet to wood. It was meant to be used for evil, but instead it was used for good. It was meant to be a symbol of God's assassination. But instead, it became the symbol of Jesus' invitation. Come to the cross. Instead of sin and stain, you are meant to be made clean. Instead of being forgotten, you are meant to know your seen. Instead of being ashamed, you can leave behind your guilt. Instead of feeling empty, you were meant to be fulfilled. Instead of being broken, you are meant to be made whole. Here, Calvary is calling. It beckons you. Behold, come to the cross. Instead of being an accident, you have a purpose and a plan. Instead of being abandoned, you were chosen by his hand. For all who've said, I can't, God has said, I can. No matter what you've done, the invitation stands. Come to the cross. Instead of being doubtful, you are meant to know your father. You are meant to be his son and you are meant to be his daughter. You were cherished from the start. You are always in the picture. Instead of being a victim, you are meant to be a victor. The result of Jesus' blood, salvation has arrived. Instead of being dead, you are meant to be alive. The cross, it was meant to signal death, but instead, it's a sign of living. It was meant to be the end, but instead, it's our beginning. for many of us 
It is uh, beautiful jewelry. It is a righteous and good sign on the side of a building. It is what hangs up down a hallway as we go from room to room. But the cross for you is meant to be deeply personal. You see, what was meant for your death actually produces hope. A new known, loving, risen hope within you where there is an invitation not to be known for your brokenness or your baggage or your sin or your bitterness or your, your addictions or your divorces or your past or that decision you made when you were 13 that haunts you or the thing that was done to you that plagues you. The cross is meant as this beautiful invitation to come. You didn't want him and he wanted you. You rejected him and he invites you. You would have asked for Barabbas and he asks for you. What is our cost? I invite you followers of Jesus to remember that cost. The cost of our redemption was his crucifixion the body of Christ broken. The beautiful thing about Good Friday is it does not end Good Friday. It was his death, but his death producing a hope, a hope that would be experienced, not simply with a cross, but the better picture of his people of an empty tomb, a promise of a new covenant, a new love, one that puts to death an old, one that is marked by not law, but grace and faith. One where the Holy Spirit comes and resides in you and leads you to become like big brother Jesus. It's a new covenant. It's a new love. And that's why we take and we drink and we remember his body poured out as a promise of love, the blood of Christ shed for you. Lord, I thank you for what you've done. I fully recognize I do not have the ability to comprehend, and one day you will kindly teach me. Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would wake up souls to the beauty of the cross, that this would not be simply a meeting in the middle of a day in good honor of a yearly church calendar, but it would be transformed if you change. And people who know you and love you, may they see the cross. It's not just a moment where they walked an aisle or they said a prayer or they believed, but a daily transformational hope that says, I want to become like my king. No one has loved me like my king. I want to be a man or a woman of love in the way of my king. Lead us in that. But we now, God, we come. And as we sing one final song, may we reflect on your goodness, on your beauty, as we worship you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.